know what to do to make a second order system well behaved and we have to extend this to higher orders because a typical op amp will have more than two poles in itself and there can be other poles in the loop gain, in the feedback path. An easy example is to consider this. And this has some EOPS, some gain. And let's say there is a capacitance here, CP. <coughs> what will be the form of loop gain? What will be the loop gain? If you didn't have CP, what would be the loop gain? Huh? A of S times? R? Which one? R1. Why? R1 plus R2. If you break it here and apply something there, you get A of S times that. And then that gets divided by the voltage divider ratio. Now what happens with the capacitor? Hmm? Yeah, you just have to take the parallel combination of this. So I will write this with conductances. If I write it with conductances, it will be G2 by G1 plus G2, right? And how do I modify this now? Huh? G1? How should I modify this expression? I wrote it in conductance form so it's convenient, that's all. D1 plus? D1 plus SC, that's all. Okay. So you can see that basically uh, compared to before you have an extra pole, right? And where is the pole? What is the, where is the pole frequency? D1 plus G2 by CP, or which is the same as 1 by R1 parallel R2 times CP. Okay. I mean that you could have guessed the CP is across a parallel combination of R1 and R2 if you assume that the op amp is a perfect voltage source, right? So you can have additional poles in the feedback path as well. So typically you will have more than two poles easily, okay? So we have to handle the case where we have more than two poles and still make the response Okay. Now, for the two pole case, we could exactly evaluate the two poles, or we didn't do it that way. We evaluated the damping factor and the natural frequency. And also, uh, we know exactly how the natural response will behave uh, depending on the damping factor. Okay. But for higher order stuff, it's not so easy. First of all, if you have more than uh, two poles, if you have a third order system, it's not clear how you would define damping factor. How would you do that? Can you do that? I mean, what's the damping factor in a third order system? So you can do it, that is, I think you know this. So first of all, if you have a polynomial with real coefficients, you will have either real roots or complex conjugate roots. So any high order polynomial, so let's say nth order can be decomposed as what? Huh? Product of? Yeah. So you have, if it is odd, you will have one linear term, right? And then you will have a certain number of. Uh, And many quadratic terms. Okay, and if it's uh, if n is odd, you need you always need one first order term. If n is even, you can have only second order terms. And uh, the second order terms, of course, can have either real roots or complex conjugate roots. Okay, and you can define the damping factors for that. Right. So that is possible. But uh, this is too painful. Basically, when you have a general third order uh, system. Uh, for analysis sake, you can do everything numerically, right? Because you can find the roots of a high order system and do all that stuff. But uh, for the sake of analysis, if I give you some general polynomial like 
a3 sq plus a2 square plus a1s plus a0 it's not clear how like the first and second order uh, factors are not clear at all okay it's just too painful to do that and also it's not easy to simply say that the roots are these okay they can be found but uh, to do it symbolically is very uh, painful okay and of course it gets even more painful for higher order stuff so we can't do that that is we can't uh, do what we did for the second order case where we essentially did an exact analysis of course we represented everything in terms of the damping factor or the natural frequency but we were able to calculate those things and say that hey they should be close to critical damping damping factor of let's say half to one and then uh, we were able to uh, show that the pole one of the poles has to be beyond the unity loop gain frequency or at best equal to the unity loop gain frequency okay so what we'll do for higher orders instead is copy what we did for the second order system okay and it's not blindly copying there is some reasoning behind it and uh, it's not clear how much time we'll have to go into like every uh, detail of this uh by the way when we talk about stability in an amplifier there are two separate things one is of course you don't want the pulse to be in the right half plane period because that then the natural response will blow up or will not die out and you can't use the amplifier at all okay so of course the second order case anyway was guaranteed to be not like that right the second order one you won't have the pulse in the right half plane but we also need another i would say more qualitative condition which is to say that the response must be well behaved okay so how well behaved is up to your definition right so in our case we said that critical damping or something close to that is what is well behaved so for that also we have to evolve the criterion for high order system okay it's not enough to be like for instance this is the s plane of course you don't want poles here for sure okay but is it okay to have the poles just inside the left half plane just to the left side of the imaginary axis what do you think will happen in that case huh? yeah so basically you know that where are the poles in the second order case for the critical damping in the second order system for the critical damping case where are the poles of the system the closed loop poles huh what no no not the so i am talking about the poles of the closed loop response v0 by vi not the poles of the loop gain okay so where are they what does critical damping mean what will happen to the denominator repeated root so there are two repeated roots here okay so for over damp case you will have two real roots for critical damp case you will have two identical real roots and then for under damp case you will have complex conjugate roots it's only with complex conjugate roots that you can get ringing right because you will have this exponential geometry which adds up to give you some cos or sin okay with only real roots with uh, exponentials with real arguments you cannot get ringing you will only get something that is monotonically decaying right so it's also not good to have poles here but we have to come up with some quantitative criterion to describe what is well behaved okay so that's what we'll do so now let's see like how much of the formal analysis we can cover but i'll try to uh, just show you the very basics of control systems and get hints from that as to what is it that we need to do okay now i don't know if you have seen this uh, kind of block diagram before this is some transfer function g of s so that means that in the laplace domain whatever is here at the output you will get g times that and this is a transfer function h which is going in the other direction so that means that whatever is here you will get h times that one over there okay and let's say this is the input u and that's the output y okay so what is y by u have you seen this block diagram before where in signals and system okay what is the result yeah evaluate it please by the way this is plus and this is minus
I am asking for why by you. What is it? One upon one plus? No. G upon G by one plus G of S H of S. Okay. Again, sanity check. If H was zero, what would happen? I mean, you simply have this part, right? So it would get G, right? Oh, how is this relevant to what we are discussing? So first of all, you look at the output Y, pass it through some transfer function H, and then it comes back to the input. So that is feedback, and you have a minus sign, so that means negative feedback. So this is the generic block diagram of a negative feedback system that you see in any control uh, systems course and so on. Okay. And in fact, one of the it's not always easy to have a negative feedback circuit and then reduce it to this block diagram, okay? Because many things will be coupled with each other. But this particular one, the non-inverting amplifier, it's very easy to do that. Okay, the control systems guys usually are more mathematical. They don't use VI and VO to denote voltages. It can be any input and any output, so U and Y. What do you understand? This is U and this is Y. So can you see the, can you make the association between the two pictures? What is G of S now? It is A. So G of S is basically a, the gain of the op amp. And what is the feedback transfer function H of S? 1 by k. So this from here to there, it's 1 by k. So that's what that is. And that's exactly what you get, right? So you get a by 1 plus a by k. And most importantly, what is this g times h? Loop gain, clearly. Okay. So if I break the loop anywhere, it doesn't matter where it is. Okay. And apply something. What will I get in return here? If I apply v test. What will I get as the return value? Minus GH times V test. So GH is the loop gain. Okay. Now well, let's do another thing. Let me add some other input here. Call it V. And now please calculate Y by V. Assuming U is 0. Okay. So this is with V being 0. And this is with you being zero. So I just added to this one. One by one plus GH. Okay. So if you have this type of uh, block diagram, the denominator is always what is in the forward path between the input and output. Okay. So before between U and Y, you had G in the forward path. Okay. And now you have one. And in the denominator, you will have one plus GH. Okay. So what will happen if you apply an input here, W, huh? quickly, what is that? Huh? Yeah, forward path is, what is the forward path gain? GH. Minus GH. From loop W to Y, it is just minus G times H, right? Okay. So what do you infer from all these results? <laughs> huh? What do you infer from all these results? The denominator is always 1 plus G H. Right? So, this is a property of any negative feedback system. So, the, you will always have. Now, I think this you know in a different way. You know that the poles are a property of the network, not where you apply the input and output. Okay? So, this is similar to that. The denominator polynomial 
is uh, by, by the way g and s themselves can be each uh, polynomial with its own denominator and numerator but uh, you know that like for a general network i think you must have seen this in basic circuits or signals and systems that the poles are a property of the network it has nothing to do with where you apply the input and where you take the output okay the zeros will depend on where you apply the input and where you take the output so here also this uh, one plus gh in the denominator will be common for every transfer function okay now it will also have additional factors which will depend on where you apply the input and where you take the output okay and this one plus gh of course this will you will get this factor for any system which looks like this which has some forward path g some path g and some path h and the whole thing is a negative feedback negative feedback is signified by minus here we are interested in negative feedback so we have built that minus sign into the system and we call gh as the loop gain right the return value that you get is minus gh now all the good things about negative feedback happens when gh is much more than 1 the magnitude of gh is much more than 1 the angle can be anything the moment the magnitude of gh is much more than 1 what happens is you can neglect this 1 when the loop gain magnitude mod gh is much more than 1 then y by u is approximately g by 1 plus gh which this thing neglected which is 1 by h okay it's only in the frequency region where this is true similarly y by v it was 1 by 1 plus gh basically it will be 1 over gh and y by w will be minus gh by 1 plus gh which is approximately minus 1 okay this is only where the magnitude of the loop gain is much more than 1 okay what happens when the magnitude of the loop gain is much less than 1 we have discussed this before what will be y by u g and what is y by v 1 and what is uh, y by w huh minus gh okay does it make sense basically there is no feedback you have just g between u and y okay it will it will only be the forward path gain okay so any negative feedback system it's an interesting thing that uh, in the frequency range where the magnitude of loop gain is much more than 1 the gain actually doesn't depend on the forward path okay it depends only on the feedback path that's why you can make the, this is another way of saying whatever i said before that the forward path has to provide a large gain but it can be imprecise okay the feedback path doesn't have to provide gain but it can it has to be precise then your gain can be very precisely defined using negative feedback okay that's the general principle this is true for however you arrange g and h these mathematical results are always true but in a good negative feedback system this is what we do okay now when the loop gain drops off below 1 it's basically like not having uh, feedback and the uh, transfer function will simply be equal to what you get from the forward path okay anyway in our case right now we are looking for something else so let me just look at one particular expression what i want to emphasize is that 1 plus gh or if i call gh as l the loop gain 1 plus l will appear in the denominator of every every negative feedback uh, uh system transfer function okay so in particular y by u is g by 1 plus g h okay and this is why you also see that whether you make an inverting amplifier or non inverting amplifier 
I don't know if you tried that. I would strongly encourage you to try. So, evaluate the transfer functions of the inverting and non-inverting amplifiers and see what you get in the denominator. Okay. And also, of course, you have to see whether the two circuits are the same or they're different from each other. I think these, some of these things have been done in uh, tutorials when you apply input here, ground there, and input there, ground here. It's all the same circuit. Okay. Yeah, by setting one of the inputs to zero, you will get the other transfer function. Okay. So that obviously means that all those circuits should have the same poles or same denominator. Right. So, but of course, you will understand it only after you work it out in detail yourselves. So right now, of course, this is true for every negative feedback system. Now, right now, we are looking for instability, right, or trying to avoid instability. Now, given this, what can you say about loop gain for it to be unstable, or at least give me one example of uh, case or one value of loop gain where it will definitely be unstable. What does instability mean? Huh? Yeah, instability basically means without uh, with zero input you can get non-zero output. And one particular example is what? The loop gain being minus one. The loop gain is minus one. All these transfer functions will go up to infinity, right? So that means that it will be oscillating. Okay. By the way, I didn't put uh, the arguments here. Loop gain L of j omega equals minus 1. This means that the closed loop system poles, where will they be? Where will they be? L of j omega, that means on the j omega axis, okay. So, at the, at the pole, the transfer function becomes infinity, right. Now, I am saying for some sinusoid, sinusoidal frequency omega, that is L of j omega becomes minus 1. So, that means that the pole is on the imaginary axis, okay. By the way, just to refresh the terminology again. So, this is the closed loop transfer function between the input u and the output y. Where you apply the input and where you take the output are of course important for this. The loop gain is GH. Okay. And that's not related to where you apply the input and where you take the output. Now, what we want is for the closed loop transfer function to be stable. So, that means that the poles of this should be in the left half S plane. Okay. So, this is the transfer function that we finally have. It's the poles of that that have to be in the left half S plane. We are not concerned with the poles of the loop gain. Okay. As long as finally the poles of G by 1 plus GH are in the left half S plane. Okay. So, don't get confused by this. So, when I say I want the poles to be in the left half S plane, it's the poles of the closed loop transfer function. That's the transfer function we are realizing. Right? So, that is the system transfer function. Now, uh, we could try to evaluate the denominator polynomial of the closed loop transfer function and do all our work from there. Like I said, that calculation itself is very messy. Okay? Loop gain is a function of s and then you have to calculate g by 1 plus gh, that is another function of s and you will get a high order polynomial. So, what we do not want to do is to have to calculate the poles of the closed loop transfer function. We want to do something simpler. Okay, so that's why we are going through all this uh, exercise of associating instability with some particular uh, point on the J omega axis and a particular value of loop gain at that point. Okay, so what we know is if L of J omega equals minus 1, 
for any omega, the system is for sure unstable. What will happen is if you do have that, the system will oscillate with a constant uh, amplitude at a frequency omega. Okay. So, what we try to do is to avoid this particular condition. Okay. That is, you try to avoid, uh, try to prevent the loop gain from becoming close to minus 1. Is this okay? Any questions? By the way, I mean, these can be precisely related to the stability criteria. That is, it is not some uh, half assed intuitive stuff that I am giving. The fact that the poles are in the left half plane and this can be related. Have you taken a course in complex variable? No? Okay. So, otherwise it is a little difficult to discuss these things. If you have taken the course, you know that there are all kinds of interesting theorems where you evaluate the function of uh, around some contour and then that will have some results in some other plane and so on. Okay. So, what happens on the S plane, what happens to the poles and zeros can be related to what happens to the loop gain precisely. Okay. But we won't go into that. At least this part you understand that the loop gain should not be minus 1 for sure. Okay. Now, what should it be? So, for that we will make an analogy with the second order system and go on. Okay. Is this part clear? What we want is for the closed loop system to be stable. That means that the poles of the closed loop system should be in the left half plane. And not only should they be in the left half plane, the damping factor of each pole pair should be sufficiently large. So that the natural response does not have a lot of ringing. Okay. When you have multiple pole pairs, you will have multiple damping factors. Let us say the worst one is the one that matters. So that has to be sufficiently large. Okay. So, that roughly speaking says that you cannot have poles like this. I mean, by the way, this picture it can be very misleading because uh, the axes are frequency. So, they have dimensions, but you know what I mean. I mean, you do not want poles inside the technically inside the left half plane, but very close to the imaginary axis. They have to be something more like this. Okay. That means that the real and imaginary parts have to be comparable. If the imaginary part is much more than the real part, that means that the damping factor is very small or quality factor is very high. Okay, you do not want that. Now, to evaluate all that from the polynomials is too complicated. So, we will look for the condition of L being minus 1 and how we made the uh, or associate our condition for the second order system in relation to that and then call that the criterion for stability of everything. Okay, so it is a little bit incomplete. If we have time, we will go more into the theory of uh, stability, but this will be this will work. I will also tell you the precise conditions under which it will work so that you do not go and uh, apply it indiscriminately to every kind of system. Okay. So, there is actually a measure of stability which is the minimum distance of L of j omega from minus 1. Okay. L of j omega itself is a complex number. Okay. As you vary the frequency, this number will uh, become close to minus 1 and so on. But the minimum distance should be something. Okay. So, there is a precise criterion based on that. Again, we will not go into that, but you get the idea. right? Essentially, there is a dangerous point L of j omega minus 1 and you have to stay far away from that. That is the that is the idea behind stability. Okay. Any questions about this? Because you have not, con not done control engineering, uh, we have to build up some basics and then do that. But we can go slowly. If you have not understood it, you can ask me questions and then I will clarify anything you want. But please be clear about which transfer function it is that we are evaluating and the poles of which one and the loop gain and so on. It is the closed loop transfer function g by 1 plus gh that has to be stable. That means that its poles have to be in the left half plane and in fact sufficiently far into the left half plane. Now, calculations of polynomials is very difficult that you know. Okay. So, that is why we do not want to do that. We will work with the loop gain and also not the polynomial L of j omega. Essentially, that means the Bode plot, right? So, we work with the Bode plot of the loop gain, the sinusoidal steady state response of the loop gain. This is convenient because this can be both measured and uh, uh, calculated. And also, this is much easier to calculate than any results with polynomials, right? Because you have the rules for the Bode plot. So, for any number of poles, you can calculate the Bode plot and plot. So, that is why this is based on convenience. In principle, you could simply calculate the closed loop transfer function and see where the poles are and do everything that you want. 
okay any questions so what we want to have is a stability criterion based on the loop gain the sinusoidal steady state response or the body plot of the loop gain rather than the polynomial of the closed loop denominator okay I mean, fine. That criterion we already know. The pole should be in the left half plane, but it's just hard to calculate where the poles are from the polynomial. Any questions on any of this? <clears throat> so let's do this for the first. Let's look at what we revisit what we did for the second order. Case and what was the loop gain? Okay, and the damping factor of the closed loop system. Again, I am emphasizing many times. Don't go and calculate the damping factor of the loop gain. The denominator here also is second order, but that has no relevance. It's the damping factor of the closed loop response that is relevant. Okay. What was this? What is the expression? K by n naught plus square root p two by p one. Okay. And also, finally, I mean, this is just uh, because we are uh, plotting the magnitude and the phase separately. What is minus one? This is a magnitude of one and an angle of five, right? Okay. So first. Let's plot the loop gain of a well-behaved second-order system. It is Z naught by k up to pole p1, and then it falls off at uh, minus 20 dB per decade. And this is the unity loop gain frequency, omega u loop, which is Z naught by k times p1. The second pole p2 will occur. Somewhere well beyond that. Okay, this I think you all agree is a well-behaved second-order system. What will be the phase response of the loop gain for this? Huh? <coughs> what is the phase response of the loop gain? What is it at very low frequencies? Zero, obviously. And then, how does it change? So at P1, what is it? Minus pi by 4, and because you have this first order type of roll-off over a wide range of frequencies, it will stay at minus pi by 2 over a wide range of frequencies. And then at P2, what will it be? And what is the asymptotic high frequency value of the phase? Minus pi. So it changes from here to there, and it is minus pi. Okay. Now, what is it that we wanted to avoid? Loop gain being minus one. Okay. Is this clear? So let me draw that. The magnitude of the loop gain is one here by definition, and the phase of the loop gain being uh, it's not the phase of the loop gain; it's the phase of minus pi. Okay, these red dots correspond to minus one, which is basically a magnitude of one, an angle of pi or minus pi. Okay. So let me just mark those points for now. Is it okay? All I'm marking is the danger point, that is minus one, 
on the plot. Now let's take something with a slightly lower damping factor than this. What uh, what will the loop gain magnitude and phase plot look like for that one? Let's say that we change the value of pole P2 so that uh, the damping factor gets a little worse. That is, it becomes a little lesser. What will that look like? Huh? So P2, I will assume everything else is the same, so that the unity loop gain frequency remains exactly the same. But P2 may be somewhere over there. Okay. What will the phase plot look like? It will follow more or less the same thing here, but then it will have okay. And if I have something even uh, worse than that, okay. So then I will have. something like that. So, you can see that as the system has less and less damping factor, as it is moving towards instability, we know that a second order system will never have complete instability. That is actually apparent from this also because you will never get a phase shift of phi, right, in a second order system. It will only asymptotically go to minus phi. You understand? The loop gain will never actually hit the phase lag of uh, minus pi. It will only go there at frequency equal to infinity. So that's another way of saying that this will always be stable because in this case, L of J of A can never be exactly minus one because the phase can never exactly be pi. Okay. So what we do is the following. You can notice that as it is moving towards instability, meaning the ringing or the damping factor is going on decreasing. You can see that the phase at the unity loop gain frequency is getting closer to minus pi. This is clear. So I look at what the phase is at a magnitude of 1. I do not want it to be as far as minus pi. Okay. But you can see as the ringing, I mean these corresponds to the, the black one, it is very far from this minus pi. And we also know because P2 is so far from omega u loop, it is as a very healthy damping factor. Whereas P2 prime, it has a, it is a little closer to this minus pi, so it has a little lower damping factor, and this red curve here corresponds to even smaller damping factor, and so on. Okay, is this fine? So essentially, we take the measure, the distance from this minus pi at the unity loop gain frequency as the margin, as a measure of stability. Okay. So, I have said this already, one is to just avoid instability, that is for the poles to be in the left half plane. The other is to have well behaved response. For that, we need to have margin and margins always are necessarily qualitative. Okay? So, depending on whether you are a risk taking person or a very conservative person, your margins can be very different. So, similarly here, which of these actually, this black or the blue or the red, all these are stable. Which one you want to use depends on the context. Okay? And depends on how things vary. Like sometimes you need to have margin because you don't know the values of the parameters precisely. So because of some reason they can vary, and even under those variations, you want it to be stable. So that's the meaning of the margin, right? So for us, the margin is the distance between angle of L of J omega u loop, that is the phase angle of the loop gain at the unity loop gain frequency and minus pi. Of course, it should not go below minus pi. Okay? That means instability for this. Is it okay? And this number, this distance is known as the phase margin and it is what is uh, very widely used for stability. Okay. Any questions about this? I mean, obviously, it's called phase margin because it's a measure of how far the phase is away from 
the dangerous point of minus 5 ok. So, just oh, that is a because uh, the loop gain being minus 1 is the problem right. So, that means magnitude of 1 and phase of 5. So, I am looking at how far away from 5 is it at magnitude of 1 ok. So, in fact I could also look at uh, the distance between the complex number L of j omega and 1 and take the minimum value of that it is just more difficult to calculate ok. So, that is really if you plot it in the complex plane this is this is telling you how closely L comes to minus 1. Are you familiar with uh, this kind of plots where you plot imaginary versus real of a complex function. So, if you do this for the loop gain minus 1 is here. So, typically loop gains with a first order will do this I mean we will if we have time we will discuss all these things for a second order it will do this it will actually never touch this one for a higher order stuff it turns out that it can go around this also and it can touch this and so on. So, the minimum distance of this curve from minus 1 is the stability margin, but it is harder to calculate. So, what I will do is I will look at where the magnitude is 1 and see how far away it is from minus pi because I know that magnitude of 1 and the angle of minus pi is going to give you instability. So, I am kind of looking at how far away you are from it. Is that ok? So, again to repeat what I said uh, many times because the polynomial calculations are hard we want to do all our calculations with the loop gain and especially with the Bode plot of the loop gain that is the sinusoidal steady state response which is much easier to calculate, simulate, measure everything ok. And also remember although I am showing the second order case here this can be done for any number of poles whereas the polynomial calculation simply becomes unwieldy after a couple of poles ok. So, that is the reason to do this and how do we do that first we recognize that L of j omega being minus 1 is a sure instability case right. If L of j omega equals minus 1 that means that the closed loop system has poles at plus or minus j omega ok and it will break into oscillation. So, we will try to avoid this ok and what is the meaning of avoid it is a very vague term. So, what we know is for the second order case we have precise results we can calculate the damping factor for a particular combination of P1 and P2. So, we look at how those systems are in relation to this point of loop gain being minus 1 and say that now generalize for every order by saying that hey if I keep this phase far away from minus pi I do not let it become as negative as minus pi at the unity loop gain frequency I will have a similar behavior ok because for third order I cannot define a damping factor right I mean for higher orders and so on. So, what I will do is so let us say so for that please uh, calculate the phase margin for the second order case with damping factor of 1 z equals to 1 for the second order case what is the phase margin and we are talking about real practical negative feedback system. So, you can assume a naught by k to be much more than 1 ok please calculate the phase margin for uh, z equals 1 half and 1 over square root of 2 by tomorrow class and we can continue the discussion and I want the answer in degrees ok and while doing that please also think about what all approximations have been made in the calculation ok. So, to be able to do the calculation we will make many approximations this is very common in engineering and you have to do it. That is right the minimum distance between L of j omega and minus 1 is 1 plus L of j omega ok thanks.